Uh, so as, as far as content goes, today we're going to cover um, a, a, a nice new chunk here, okay? And this is going to be uh, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals uh, for numeric variables. And so I think this is very, uh, very useful. And we will, um, and next week we will cover uh, some new stuff, but the, uh, you know, the material gets a little bit uh, lighter in terms of content that's uh, being covered. And then the week after that will be uh, review for the final exam. And then the week after that is the final exam. So it's just uh, just a few more weeks, um, and that that will be our our, uh, our time together. So uh, um, I know, uh, yeah. So when will you post the um, like kind of like the not preview, but like yeah, I'll I'll post the final. practice final exam. Um, I'll post that up this week, okay? And you can start taking a look at it. Um, and next week we'll we'll cover some stuff, but uh, but your primary homework next week. This week will be on um, on the stuff I cover this chapter, but the uh, the the following week your your homework will be to work through the practice final. Okay, and I think that's a good um, it, it will serve as a good guide for what what's on the final exam. Okay, I think I've been very fair in terms of giving you guys practice oh, yeah. for yeah. for your um, for your stuff, and so. Um, so anyway, and I hope you guys feel like you're learning and enjoying statistics a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. I just, I just, okay, if I just, I have a quick one. Okay. I've had 20 years of anxiety of, oh my God, I have to take a math class. And I know it's just timing, but um, I guess I just landed at the right place at the right time. So well, I'm, I'm happy you feel that way, so. It, my, my husband says, you've been a math Brady cat, <laughs> and it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, so. Okay. Well, well, thank you. So, well, be sure you come in a couple of weeks when you do uh, your uh, reviews, uh, student evaluations of me. Uh, let them know that uh, that you like me. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, today we are covering hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. for numeric variables. So all of the stuff we covered last week and all of the stuff before has, had all been de dealing with categorical variables. So when ca you have categorical variables, you use proportions and, and we do analysis on the proportions. This time, now that we are dealing with numeric variables, how do we summarize numeric variables? What, what kind of statistics can be used to summarize a numeric distribution or numeric variable? Um, the mean? <laughs> OK. So, uh, so we'll be talking about the mean. And, um, and the other part that goes into it will be standard deviation. OK. So when we are summarizing numeric variables, we will use the, uh, we will be dealing with the mean, okay, and standard deviation. So sometimes I, I worry a tiny bit just because every time I ask these big, big picture idea questions, I feel like, <laughs> exactly. Um, we're not always sure what we're talking about. And then, of course, when I say the mean, you're like, oh, yeah, I know the mean. But, um, but you know, the big, big idea is when you summarize categorical variables, you use counts and percentages. When you summarize numeric variables, you're using the mean or uh, a measure of spread, OK? The mean um, measure of center or measure of spread. So generally, mean and standard deviation, but other times we can use other things. OK. so. Um, Let's talk about this. Just um, and as far as big picture stuff goes, okay. The big picture behind confidence intervals and the big picture behind hypothesis test remains the same as they were before, okay. So what's the big picture for confidence intervals? Okay. 
course, more crickets here. Um, so big picture for confidence intervals, you know, we look at a sample. And based on the sample, we wish to make conclusions about what? Make conclusions about population. Thank you. I was, I was getting ready to uh, have a pity party for myself. OK. So based on the sample, we wish to make conclusions about the population. OK. So before, let me um, just uh, get this set up here. This is Um, before we would look at the proportion, and based on the proportion in our sample, we would make a conclusion about the proportion in the population. Okay. Now that we're dealing with numeric variables, okay, we will uh, find the mean of our sample. Okay, and based on that, we make conclusions about the mean of the population. So we will find the mean of our sample, and based on that, we make conclusions about the mean of the population. And uh, whenever we use the confidence interval, what goes in the middle of our confidence interval? Our, our current estimate of the, of the uh, in our case, would be the population mean, right? So in the center, we put our estimate. And so what is our estimate of the population mean? Our uh, sample mean, OK? Our estimate, which would be our sample mean. And our sample mean is what symbol? X bar, right? OK? And then. So our confidence interval is always in the form of you know, our center, our estimate, plus or minus what? The margin of error. Okay, And the margin of error is made up of two parts. And what are those two parts? A critical value. times the standard error. Is that OK? All right, and so when we create a confidence interval for the population mean, it's going to be x bar plus or minus. Our critical value is uh, going to be called t star. We just use a different letter times our standard error. OK? But what I want to say is that this part, having our estimate plus or minus the margin of error, this is exactly the same as it was when we were dealing with proportions, right? For proportions, it was also you have the center, which is your estimate. In that case, it was p hat plus or minus the margin of error, which was a critical value times the standard error. Okay? So conceptually, and as far as the big picture goes, it remains the same. The only thing that changes are the letters that we use, OK? And our formula for the standard error will change as well, OK? So the big picture for confidence intervals, in the center we've got x bar plus or minus t star times the standard error, OK? And so as far as changes go, our, our standard error, the formula for standard error is going to be s over the square root of n, OK? Do you guys remember what s stands for? I know it's been a little while, but what does S stand for? Sigma. Uh, sigma. OK, so what does S and sigma stand for? That stands for, what, what is the name of this? 
the standard deviation of our sample. Okay, S is our standard deviation of our sample. Okay, and what is N? Yeah, number of observations, our sample size, right? Okay, so just to summarize, I got x bar plus or minus t star times our standard error, which is s over the square root of n. This is a confidence interval for the population mean. What is the symbol for the population mean? Mu? Yes? Yes. Okay, so confidence interval for the population mean mu based on a sample. Okay, and so it's x bar plus or minus t star times s over the square root of n. Okay? Oh, my battery's just died. Give me a second here. on? Yes. All right, so that's, that's what we have. To, um, to look up t star, okay, so t star comes from our t table. And it depends on our confidence level and our degrees of freedom, okay? So we need to find what's called df. And df is equal to our sample size minus 1. Degrees of freedom minus 1. OK, so let me just demonstrate how this works. Does everyone have this written down? No? no? OK. Can you write a little bigger? Can I write a little bit bigger? <laughs> OK, sure, sure. Um, I'll, I'll try, right, you know? DF. DF, yes. DF for degrees of freedom. DF stands for degrees of freedom. Sorry, you know, it's like uh, you're used to writing a certain size, so. I just can't see yours. OK. Um, there is an open seat up here. If you'd like to move closer as well, that's, uh, that's always allowed. Um, yeah, I, I always wonder, uh, you know, those of you who sit in the back row, all the way in the back, I'm like, you must have uh, good vision. Huh? Eagle vision, that's, that's great. Okay. Uh, oh, should I turn off turn off this front light also? Does that help? Yes, please. Okay. That enhances the eagle vision, right? It also might cause people to fall asleep too, right? I, re I remember in, uh, when I was taking classes, anytime this teacher dimmed the lights, it would be like instant out. I would just fall asleep. I couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. I'm like, don't don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, right. And then. Um, and if I fall asleep, like sitting, I'll like um, spaz, right? Like I'll just like um, jerk or what? what I, I well, maybe spaz, spaz is not the right word, but uh, twitch, twitch. Um, it's, a better word. it's a better word. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> apparently in well in America, um, it's not as offensive, but in other countries, it's very offensive the the word to spaz. Yeah. So anyway. S, yeah, S, well, okay, so we can talk about this. S is usually given, but if you had to find the standard deviation of a sample, we know how to do that, right? Or, you know, we, we've learned how to do that, I should say. <laughs> yeah, question. 
CI, CI, confidence interval. OK. Do we have this all written down now? No. How is that? How can it still be a no? Uh, OK, let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next slide anyway. Here we go. You get, I feel like, all right, ruthless, right? So we have x bar plus or minus t star times our standard error, which is s over the square root of n. This is, again, a confidence interval for the population mean. So we'll, uh, we'll try an example here, OK? So we will say, um, what? is the um, average weight of, I don't know, what is the average weight of a tomato? This is very exciting, OK? So um, anyway, we, uh, we go to um, some, maybe, I don't know, beefsteak tomato doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway, so we um, we obtain a random sample of we'll say 20 tomatoes. Okay. And, you know, I could write all of these down. Actually, what is the average weight of a tomato? What of a beefsteak tomato, exactly, you know, the ones that they sell at the store. All right, average weight of beefsteak tomato. Oh, man, this is 12 to 16 ounces? That's a full one pound, a one pound, and this doesn't make sense. All right, I'm just going to make some of them numbers up. Don't, don't, don't object to me, okay? Uh, so we'll say um, uh, the average weight, uh, we'll say what? I'm like trying to imagine this beefsteak tomato in my hand here. Um, the average weight of our tomatoes is, um, we'll say, 240 grams with a standard deviation of 28 grams. Who knows? OK. So that's, that's, these are based on our sample, right? So these numbers come from our sample, just, just in case we were wondering. OK. If, if I gave you raw data, you could get the mean and the standard deviation, right, yourself, if you had to? OK, so uh, based on our sample, let's make a 95% confidence interval. Ninety-five percent confidence interval for the mean weight of all tomatoes, OK? Or mean weight of all beefsteak tomatoes. Maybe they're much bigger. Who knows? I'm making up this data. If you're a tomato farmer, don't get mad at me here. It is quite clear that I know nothing about tomatoes here. OK. So um, what goes in the middle of our interval here? What is our, here, let's, um, let's do what I recommend. Let's line up, let's list off the pieces of data that we have. We have x bar, we have s. We have n, and then we will find t star. OK, so what is our x bar equal to? Two hundred forty, right? This is the mean. What is s? Twenty eight, our standard deviation of our sample. What's n? Twenty, sample size. And t star, we've got to go to our 
T table. So pull out your reference tables. Okay. And we're going to go to the page that says T distribution critical values. Okay. All right. So remember what I said, degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. So what is our degrees of freedom? We have 20 minus 1, so we have 19 degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we're going to go to the column that says confidence level 95%. We go to the row 19 degrees of freedom. And we say, oh, our T star is 2.093. How? OK, so, so I got degrees of freedom equal to 19, right? We're good there. And then when we have our confidence level, we look at the tops of our paper. And it says confidence level 95%, because in our problem it says we want to make a 95% confidence interval. So we're going to say 95%. We go down. At 19 degrees of freedom, our value here is 2.093. Yes? Yes. Okay. All right, and so now it's just a matter of plugging in these values. X bar plus or minus T star times S over the square root of N. So I have 240 plus or minus 2.093 times 28 divided by the square root of 20. So now I have, so this gives me 240 plus or minus, and then let's do our math here. 2.093 times 28 divided by the square root of 20. I get 240 plus or minus 13.1. I guess I could keep going. 13.10425. Can you show how you How I did the table thing? Yeah. yeah, okay. So are you okay? So the problem says we're going to make a 95% confidence interval. And then for degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom is n minus 1, right? So I have 19 degrees of freedom. That's, that's okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, if, when I go to the table, I go to the T table, confidence level. 95%. I go down this column until I reach degrees of freedom equal to 19. And then when those meet, I get 2.093. Got it? OK, so anyway, I plug these in, and I do 2.093 times 28 divided by the square root of 20. And I get 13.1 in my calculator. So I create my confidence interval, and on the high side, 240 plus 13.1 gives me 253.1. And on the low end, 240 minus 13.1 gives me 236.9, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry, 226.9, not 236, 226.9. Okay. Are we okay with getting our high and low ends of our confidence interval? Yes. So this is exactly the same as it was before, right? Except um, we're dealing with means rather than proportions. And so do, what do I say? I say I am what? 95% confident that the mean weight of all beefsteak tomatoes is between 226.9 grams and 253.1 grams. Okay. So someone comes along and says, hey, um, I think the average weight of beefsteak tomatoes is 300 grams. What would you say? 
you'd say, no, I have evidence against that, right? So we can say things like, we have evidence that the mean weight is not 300 grams. Okay, but if someone else says, oh, you know, I think the average weight is 250 grams, what would you say? Yeah. You'd say, maybe, right? You'd say, I can't dispute that, right? So we would have to say, we do not have evidence. So we, we don't say we have evidence that it is 250 grams. We just say 250 is in our interval, so it's plausible, okay? So we say, we do not we have the double negative here going on. We do not have evidence against the claim that the mean weight is 200. I'm sorry, 250. Okay, so 250 grams is possible. Our data does not prove that it's 250 grams, but 250 grams is possible. In the low, no, or the, the, the this part right here? Yeah. Okay, so on my calculator, I just typed in 2.093 mm -hmm. times 28 divide by uh, square root button 20. So that, this is just how I'm typing it in my calculator here, and then whoops, I don't want the plus, and then I just hit equals, and there I get 13.1. Uh, All right, is that okay? So that's, uh, that's a confidence interval for the population mean. So remember, our, our um, inference is always about the population, never about the, uh, the sample, okay? So in, in today's quiz, you know, it's asked things like, what's the alternative hypothesis? It's always about you know, the population, it's the statement that says all of whatever, that's the, uh, the correct one. It's not about the people in your study, it's the, about the people in the entire population. Okay? All right, so that's a, that's a confidence interval. Um, we'll keep going on here. That's, um, that's a confidence interval for one sample, okay? Um, we'll expand our um, our thing and we'll create a confidence interval for a difference between means based on two samples. Difference between two population means based on two samples, okay? And so you did something similar with proportions, right? Oh, no, no, we, we, we actually haven't done it for proportions. I apologize, I take that back. <laughs> okay, so, um, so here, basically, we're, we're coming up with a confidence interval for what is the difference between the average group one and the average of group two. So, for example, we could say, what is the height difference between the average male height and the average female height, okay? So if you had to kind of ballpark a number for the average height difference between the average male and the average female, what would you guess? Five you know, five inches, six inches, something like that, right? So we would say, you know, the average male is, you know, a, between five and six inches taller than the average female. Okay, so notice we're not actually stating 
the average height of the male, nor are we stating about anything about the average height of the female. All we're doing is we're making a statement about the difference between the average male and the average female height. Okay, and so when it comes to height, we're expecting, um, on average, the average male to be between, you know, eh, five to six, maybe five to seven inches taller than the average female, something around there. Okay, of course, if you pick two individuals, their difference can be much greater or much less than that, right? You might get a really tall man and a really short woman, and you might have a difference of two feet or something like that, right? Um, you know, maybe a, a foot, or uh, or you could get, or you know, a, a man who's short and a woman who's tall, and you would have a difference of you know negative five inches or something like that. Okay, so as far as individuals go, the difference could be much greater or much less, but here we're making a confidence interval for the difference between two population means. Is that okay? What we're doing there. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to kind of start off. All of my gadgets are acting up today. Um, yeah, so uh, just an example. Example uh, CI uh, for, and this is going to be mu1 minus mu2, the quantity mu1 minus mu2. Okay, so we could ask what is the average. Or I should say, what is the difference in height between the average male height, which we'll, we will label mu1, and the average female height? And so, you know, just an example CI could be, you know, five inches to seven inches. And we would say we are 95% confident that the height or the average height of males. is between five inches taller and seven inches taller and the average height of females. Maybe I'll ask Google to convert for metric or international friends. What is five inches in centimeters? Five inches equals 12.7 centimeters. 12.7 centimeters. Well, thank you very much, Lady Google. Does Lady Google have a name? Apple is Siri. Yeah. <laughs> what is seven inches in centimeters? All right, so we'll just say 17.8 centimeters. No, I, I did. I said, what is your name? And she said, here are some, no, she just said, it, she just found like results for name. And it's like, that's, uh, that's not, not as much uh, personality. I mean, she's very clever, actually. Yeah, I can ask things like, um, no, definitely not a flirt, right? Uh, yeah, but well, Siri might flirt, but uh, Lady Google's all business, right? That's, uh, that's what I'm going to call her, Lady Google, right? Lady Google. Um. <laughs> Lady Liberty, oh no. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so is this okay?
All right, so we'll get into the uh, the nitty gritty of this, okay? But again, just from a big picture standpoint, it's exactly the same as before. In the center, we put um, our estimate plus or minus our margin of error. Okay, and the margin of error is a critical value. I should say the margin of error is critical value times the standard error. And so we're going to have our estimate goes in the middle, plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. Okay? So the estimate, what do you think is the best estimate for mu1 minus mu2? So, so what we're trying to estimate is the difference between the mean of population 1 and the mean of population 2. What do you think our best guess for that quantity is based on the data available to us? We, huh? So our, our best estimate is going to be the difference between our sample means, right? So we want to estimate the pop difference between population means. Our best estimate is going to be the difference between sample means. Is that, is that, does that make sense? So our et best estimate is going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2, that quantity. Does that kind of make sense? Because X bar is the, you know, our sample mean that corresponds to the population mean, right? Seems reasonable. Okay. Plus or minus critical value is going to be T star. And the standard error, I'm going to write the formula. It's just an ugly formula for standard error. But if you have all the pieces, you just plug it in and you get your number. Okay. So the standard error is equal to this formula, S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. OK? And that's that. So all you need to do is just go through the sample and you pick out your numbers and you plug them in, okay? And then um, the degrees of freedom for T star, T star needs the degrees of freedom, DF for T star is equal to N minus 1, but we have two Ns. We've got an N1 and we have an N2. So we use the smaller value between N1 and N2 as our N, okay? N1 and N, N minus 1 use the smaller value between N1 and N2. Okay. So just as far as the little details go, there are a few differences. But as far as the big picture goes in terms of what a confidence interval does and the conclusions we can make from it, that hasn't changed. Okay. The key part here is just recognizing, do I have one sample or do I have two samples? Okay. So as you're reading a problem, you're going to have to say, well, do I have one sample or two samples, right? OK, so shall we try one of these out? Why not, right? OK, so we'll say. Um, Okay, so we'll say, what is the difference in price between, we'll say, a new, name a car here, Honda Civic, sure, okay, 
between a new Honda Civic and a three-year-old Honda Civic. This is the question that we want to know. So how much does the Honda Civic lose? How much value does a Honda Civic lose over three years of time? I have no idea, okay? So we're just going to make up some numbers here. We could go on Kelly Blue Book, but um, all right, so we'll take, we need two samples, right? Sample one is going to be um, a, a random sample of new Honda Civics, right? Okay, so um, how many new Honda Civics will we look at? Our N1 is going to be what? Just the number. So we'll say we looked at 20 new Honda Civics, and what is the average price that we found? New ones? Of new Honda, Honda Civics. Let's say I feel like more than that. 20. We'll go. You're saying it's a lot. He's saying it's not enough. All right, all right, all right. So we'll go. Uh, we'll go to TrueCar.com. We'll 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 settle this. Okay. Shop new. We're gonna go to Honda. Civic sedan. All right. Okay. Let's. Uh, all right. Target price, eighteen nine seventy six. All right. Huh? Okay. That's for LX automatic. All right. Whatever. Okay. This is this is what we're looking at. Okay. So all right. So we'll say eighteen nine seventy six. This is our average after 20 cars, and we'll say the standard deviation um, of sample one, I don't know, the cars can vary quite a bit, we'll say uh, is uh, $2,050. Uh, I think that's right. I'm just making up these numbers, don't, don't hold me to that, okay? So that's sample one, okay? Sample two, so all of the numbers from sample one, our N, our X bar, and our S, all have a subscript of one to indicate that they're coming from sample one, all right? Sample two will be our random sample of three-year-old Honda Civics. Okay, and so N2, let's say we looked at 15, um, three-year-old Honda Civics, and we'll say the average, should I go on KBB? Yeah. Huh? You guys want to play this game? Or maybe I'll go to, um, uh, we'll go to uh, CarMax. So a three-year-old would be what, 2012? Yeah, it's going to ask me all of these questions, but let's just say, um, we want a 2012 Honda Civic. Okay, 17998, 16, 13, So it all, you know, obviously all of these things depend on a bunch of stuff, right? Okay, okay, all right, blah, 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 blah. All right, so we got, um, you know, 18, 16, 6, 16, 6, uh, 13, 6, 14, uh, you know, 15, 15. Okay, so I'm just going to ballpark a number and I'm going to say 14.7, okay? For three-year-old Honda Civic. And uh, we'll say there, you know, there's there's quite a bit of variation. We'll also say um, $2,200 in variation, okay? Or standard deviation. Is this okay? All right, so, you know, here's our data. Okay, so now we want to know what is the difference in price between the new, what is, yeah, I should say, what is the average difference? I gotta put that in here. Average difference in price between a new Honda Civic and a three year old Honda Civic. Okay, so what is our um, confidence interval formula? It's gonna be x bar one minus x bar two plus or minus t star times our standard error, which is this thing s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over N2. Okay, so I kind of gave you all of this as we're, we were working through the problem. Now, most problems, 
are not going to have these all labeled nicely for you. It's not going to say N1 is this and X bar 1 is this and all of this, okay? So part of your job is to read through a paragraph and say these numbers correspond to sample 1. So these are N1, X bar 1, and S1. These numbers correspond to sample 2. So that would be N2, X bar 2, and S2. So your job is to read a problem and identify basically these six values, okay? So you have to uh, be able to read a problem and identify, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say which values correspond to which sample or I'll say correspond to samples one, sample one and sample two. Okay, and label them N1. Okay, and I think this key, uh, just this step of labeling the values in a problem with N1, X bar one, S1, N2, X bar two, and S2, that step of just labeling the values will just clear up a lot of problems students have, okay? Because I think students just immediately start to try to start sticking numbers into the formula, and, uh, and then they run into problems. So just take an extra minute, say, hey, these numbers are this, this is this number, this is this number, and then once you have those, then it's, then it's very straightforward as to how to plug these numbers in, okay? What is the degrees of freedom that we're going to use for T-star? Yeah, it's t degrees of freedom is n minus 1, but we use the smaller n, right? So we're going to have 15 minus 1, we have 14 degrees of freedom. And let's say I want to make a 95% confidence interval. So we will use our t star is then going to be equal to what? Yeah, so we go to our table, and we say 14 degrees of freedom, 95% confidence, 2.145. So let's just, uh, we'll plug in all of our numbers here. So I'll use uh, red. So we're going to have 18,976 minus 14,700 plus or minus 2.145 times the square root of S1. 2050 squared over 20 plus 2200 squared over 15. Okay, so let's uh, let's do this. 18976 minus 14700. 4276, that's our average, uh, that's the difference we have here, 4276, plus or minus, okay, and then so now uh, I have to do this in a few steps, and do 2050 squared divided by 20 plus 2200 squared divided by 15. Okay, so that's everything inside the square root. I hit enter and I get 532,000, some big number. So I'm going to take the square root of that. Okay, and that gives me 729. And I multiply that by 2.145. And I get 150, 1565.69. Okay, is that okay? So this is plus or minus 1565.69. So far so good, or have I lost anyone? Lost? Or did I lose you? Just writing down numbers. Okay, maybe I wrote them too. Yeah, okay, so I'll basically from the blue 
to the red, all I did was I took our numbers over here, because I labeled every single one of them, and I just plugged in, you know, where x bar 1 is, I plugged in 18,976. And then I plugged in this number, 14,700, plus or minus our t star, which we found from our table. And then I plugged in s1 and n1, s2 and n2. Okay. And then I, I went ahead and I did the calculation here. Okay. And so this is just a matter of plugging it into your calculator. So it might be a good exercise just to make sure that you can get this value on your calculator. Can you go through and do that again? Go through and do it on the calculator again? OK. So um, the way I'm going to do this on the calculator is I start on the inside here. I'm going to do everything on the inside. Then I'm going to take the square root of that result. And then I'm going to multiply that result by 2.145. So I'm going to start off doing 2050, and I hit the square button on my calculator, and I hit divide by 20, and then I hit plus 2200 squared divide by 15, and I'm going to hit equals. Okay, so that's everything inside the square root. So I get 532,791. I'm going to take the square root of that result. Are we okay there? Square root, answer button, equals. I get 729.92579. The square root of the answer. Still good? And so I'm going to take that result and multiply it by 2.145. So I hit times 2.145, and I hit equals. And I get 1565.69. Okay? And so now I do 4276 plus this, 4276 plus 1565.69. And on the high end, I get um, 5841.69, $5,841.69. And on the low end, I get 2,710.31. So that you know that that's quite a bit of range, but um, but that's probably because there's quite a bit of range in car values, even for a Honda Civic, because um, you can go from cheap to fancy, right? Yes. So, so our answer to our question, right, is, um, I'm going to go ahead and write this here, I am 95% confident that a three-year-old Honda Civic, I'm going to just abbreviate it to HC, it will cost between Two thousand seven hundred ten point three one uh, and five thousand eight hundred forty one point six nine less than a new Honda Civic. But this is the key word is on average. And I'm sorry I had to write small here, okay? Just because it I needed to get it to fit. But it's on average. Okay. Any individual car, if you pick the you know supreme new Honda Civic, and you pick a three-year-old Honda Civic that you know has gotten into an accident and has a huge dent and has two hundred thousand miles on it, somehow, um, it's gonna you know have a much greater difference, right? And if you you know so, any individual car might the the difference could be even greater or less than what's specified here. But uh, on average, if we could somehow identify the average new car, new Honda, and the average three-year-old Honda, we're saying it would cost between you know 2,700 and 5,800 less. That there's a difference between there. So if we chose to do Tesla instead of Honda, and there's only two models of Tesla, we would have. Yeah, yeah, if you, um, right, so if you get like a Tesla where you don't really have m many options to, 
um, make it nicer or less, uh, less nice, um, you're probably going to, you know, your standard deviation here is going to be uh, much smaller, right? As far as new Teslas go, I, I don't even know what uh, options you can do to make, you know, it, I don't, they don't, there's no dealership, right? So you can't negotiate price and things like that, so, right? So your standard deviation for a new Tesla might even be like zero or just something very small, right? Um, and then the used Tesla, there's obviously going to be some, some standard deviation there because they're not all going to be the same as far as uh, used Teslas, but yeah. Um, so something like that, okay? Is this, uh, are we okay here? So if somebody says, um, you know, do we have evidence that um, used Hondas cost less than new Hondas? You would say, no. you would say yes, we have evidence that used Hondas cost less than new Hondas. And, and the, the reason for that is because our entire interval, there's no zero in our interval. So sometimes, you know, I mean, with new and used cars, it's like obvious that the used car is going to be worth less than the new car. But, um, um, but in other cases, you know, group one and group two, they might be very comparable. And somebody might ask a question, is there evidence that group one's mean is different from group two's mean? And then the way we answer that question is if, um, if zero is inside our interval. Okay. Do we have all of this written down? Can I flip to the next slide? Okay, so we'll do that. So um, regarding conclusions based on a confidence interval. Um, actually, I should say based on a confidence interval for two samples. Okay, and so the key here is, you know, we're, we're, somebody might ask, you know, do we have evidence that the mean of group one or I should say mean of population one is different from the mean of population two. Okay. And the answer to this depends on is zero in our interval. Okay, so if zero is inside the confidence interval, okay, meaning um, the low end is negative and the high end is positive, okay, if zero is inside the confidence interval, then we will not have evidence that the mean of population one is different from the mean of population two. And on the other hand, if zero is not inside the confidence interval. Okay, so um, both low and high have the same sign. Low, low and high ends have the same sign. Then we do have evidence that the means of the populations are different.
I will let you guys get that written down. Flip. Okay. <laughs> of course not. I'm playing a game while I'm waiting on you guys now. <laughs> All right, are you guys, uh, now can I go? That's okay. It's uh, seven little words. Pancakes, nine letters. It's like a crossword. Flapjacks, excellent. <laughs> okay. Next, uh, next slide. Yes, great. Okay, so that was confidence intervals. Okay, and then we're gonna do hypothesis tests. Okay, we got hypothesis tests when we got one sample. Hypothesis tests when we have two samples. The overall concept for everything is still the same as it was for proportions. So with proportions, you also did hypothesis tests for one sample and hypothesis tests for two samples, right? Except you were dealing with proportions. When we're dealing with um, numeric variables, we're dealing with means, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll cover all of this. Hypothesis tests for one sample, hypothesis tests for two samples. Um, but the overall concepts behind creating a hypothesis test is, uh, is the same as before. So I, can, I could even go back to um, the lecture slides that, um, that we did last week. And uh, oh, this is the other class. Okay, so you know you start off with your hypotheses. Okay, so don't write this down. This is for proportions. Okay, so it's the same idea. Well, that that was with two samples. Let's. Okay, um, this time we're just going to replace the p's with mu's. Okay, and then we go through and um, we look at, label our data. We calculate our z and p value, and then we make our conclusions. And uh, and this, the same stuff that we did earlier last week for hypothesis tests with proportions, same, same stuff applies here when we're doing hypothesis tests for numeric variables or for means, okay? So we're gonna start off with hypothesis tests for, um, for means, and this is one sample, okay? So we start off write our hypotheses. Okay. Our null hypothesis is always going to be about mu. The population mean is equal to some value. Maybe I'm just going to make up a number 42. Okay. So this is um, the mean of the population is 42. So again, our hypotheses are always about the population. So the population would be everyone relevant to our research question, right? 
So it's not about the people in our sample, but it's all people, whatever. The mean of the population is 42. All right, and then the alternative is identical to our null hypothesis, except we replace the equal sign with a different symbol, okay? This one, we have a not equal sign. This one's the um, two-sided test, right? Not equal sign means two-sided test. Greater than or less than signs mean one-sided test. And so this all depends on how the question is written, right? Do we have evidence that something is greater than 42 or less than 42 or different from 42? So depending on how the question is written, we'll determine whether we use the not equal sign or the greater than sign or the less than sign. Okay. All right, so, so here we're going to uh, label our data. So the data we need will be x bar, s, and n. So n is our sample size. s is our sample standard deviation. And x bar is our sample mean. OK. So far, so good. So number three is calculate your test statistic. And uh, look up the p-value. I'm hoping these steps at least feel familiar. OK, it's just we're just using different letters. It's the only thing that's changed. Okay, but the steps, the big picture part, it's still the same. Okay, so our test statistic here, uh, we use the the t. Okay, so so here, I guess, I'll, I'll say whenever you're dealing with proportions, you're always going to be dealing with the normal table, the z table, and your test statistics are z. Your critical value is z. When you're dealing with numeric variables, you're dealing with the t table, your critical val values are t stars, and your test statistics are t's. Okay? So means go with t, proportions go with z. And that's, that's always going to be the case. So here, our test statistic t is going to be the difference between x bar minus mu divided by our standard error. Okay? And this should also kind of feel familiar. It's the difference between what you found in your sample minus what's written in the null hypothesis divided by a standard error. Okay? And our standard error here is s over the square root of n. So it's just a matter of taking the numbers, throwing them in here, and you have your test statistic t. Is this OK? All right. So the only, OK, so and let me just kind of compare this with what we did in um, <coughs> hypothesis testing for proportions. OK, so notice we're getting our test statistic over here, z, and it's p hat, your sample proportion minus p what's in your null hypothesis divided by the standard error. Okay, Same over here. Rather than p hat, we have our sample mean. So not sample proportion, but sample mean. So it's x bar minus what's written in our null hypothesis 
divided by the standard error. Okay, so even even the pieces of it are are the same. It's just because it's means we we use different symbols here. All right, so the, there is a I guess a significant shift in how we use the t table. Okay, so the next part is still the same. We take our test statistic and we look it up in the reference table to get a p-value. But how we do this is going to be different, okay? So what we need is we have the degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1, okay? And to get our p-value, okay, we find um, where our our t quote unquote fits in. Okay? And the p value or the tail area is the corresponding column headings. Okay? Okay, so the tail area is the corresponding column headings. Okay, and so this is um, for one-sided tests. The p-value equals the tail area. And for two-sided tests, P value is two times our tail area. Okay, so whether you double the um, tail area or not depends entirely on whether you have the not equal sign here or a greater than or less than sign. And that's also the same as it was before. Okay, but the using the t table feels a little bit or is different than the way we use our z table. So I just want to try a few um, practice drills in uh, using the t table. Okay. Uh, but I guess um, I will uh, we'll finish out the kind of this process outline. We'll do step four, which is making our conclusions. Um, but that's that's also the same as it was before. Okay, so I'll, we'll write it down once today, <laughs> and then uh, when we do the um, for two samples, I'll just point point you back to it. But I could even point you back to uh, what we wrote last week. But um, but we'll write it down. I think it's good to uh, emphasize. Okay, but may I go to the next slide? Okay, yes. Okay, so last, lastly, we're going to make our conclusion. Make the conclusion based on our p-value. Okay, so in the previous step, we got our p-value. Okay, and so um, we will have an alpha. Okay, so we have alpha either given given to us and if it's not given to us what do we assume alpha is equal to okay or uh, assume alpha equals 0 0.05 okay and then so if the p value is less than alpha what do we do we reject what? The null, hypothesis. the null hypothesis. Okay, and we say we have evidence that whatever the null hypothesis says is uh, wrong. Okay, or we can say we have evidence.
that, you know, whatever is in the alternative hypothesis is true. Okay, something like that. Uh, if our p value is greater than alpha, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and we would say we do not have evidence. against the null hypothesis, okay? Or, you know, we do not have evidence to support the alternative, whatever the alternative says, okay? And of course, we, we never write, we accept the null hypothesis, okay? So we also say, we do not say I have not talked about type 1 and type 2 error yet, right? Okay, that's next week. That will be next week. Okay, but and this part is all also all familiar, right? Because because we did this with hypothesis testing. Okay, so I want to talk about just using the t table, and then we'll work through an example, and then we'll we'll cover the uh, the last topic, which is hypothesis testing for means, but with two samples. I know it feels like a lot. I guess it kind of is, but um, but I'm hoping that you know by drawing the parallels between what you've already learned, this is not all that different, right? It's like, um, I don't know, just learning how to do the same things on just a new, a slightly different system. Okay. All right. Are we okay? No? Yes? Yeah? I think that was a yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So let's, um, we'll just use the T table. Okay. Using the T table. to get p-values. So this is just um, part of step three. Okay, so this is just, just covering one part of step three. So, you know, after you finish the first part of step three, you will have a test statistic, a t, and a degrees of freedom. And now we want to get the p-value, okay? So after, um, doing step 3a, step 3 part a, you will have a test statistic t and a degrees of freedom, df, okay? So then you must look this up in the t-table. To get a p-value. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about this. All right, so scenario one. Okay, your t is equal to three point one zero degrees of freedom is equal to seven and your alternative hypothesis is e um, 
your alternative hypothesis is mu is greater than uh, 20. It doesn't matter. Okay. So the p-value, the corresponding p-value, what is that? Okay, we're going to go to our table. So is, everyone's got this down? Our t is 3.1. We have 7 degrees of freedom. Okay. So what we do is we go to this row, 7 degrees of freedom. So the only row that matters. And we're going to look for where I have 3.1. Okay. So where would 3.1 fit in this thing? It would fit in in between 2.998 and 3.499. Are we in agreement there? Yes. OK. And so notice at the top of our columns, it says right tail probability. OK. So if 3.1 is in between these two columns, so our p value is in between these two numbers. Okay, I look at the top of the column. My p value is in between 0 0.010 and 0 0.005. Okay. Is that okay? So, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I should say my tail area or right tail probability. I guess I, I should first start off by saying the tail area is between 0 0.010 and 0 0.005. And because um, alternative is one sided, it has the greater than sign, our p value equals our tail area. So I could say my p-value is between, um, and I'm going to just flip these numbers around because it's I think it's customary to write the smaller number before the larger number. You could say it's between 100 and 60, but it's generally in English we say it's between 60 and 100, right? So here it's between 0 0.005 and 0 0.010. The, the zero is optional, right? And 0.01. All right, so in our case, would we reject the null hypothesis? Is this, if alpha is equal to 0 0.05, what would we do? Would we reject yes or no? Is our p value bigger or smaller than 0 0.05? Smaller, right? So, you know, if we look at this, you know, this is less, our p value is less than alpha. So we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. We could also write, um, you know, a little bit of mathematical notation. We can say 0 0.005 is less than our p-value, which is less than 0 0.010. Okay. So these these two statements are equivalent. To say the p-value is between 0 0.005 and 0 0.010 is the same as saying 0 0.005 is less than our p-value. And our p-value is less than 0 0.010. Nick, you could write it in this compressed form as well. Is that OK? All right, let's try scenario two. OK, let's say our t ends up being um, 5.4. We have degrees of freedom equal to 10. And our alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal 700. Are we OK? No? You just have to write these numbers down. All right, here we go. Huh? E Eagle vision. Yeah, OK. All right, so now I'm going to look at the row degrees of freedom equal to 10, which is uh, this one right here. OK. 
Okay. And I want to know where does um, where does the value 5.4 fit in? Okay, but it goes on this side, right? So 5.4 would go over here. Okay. So I don't have anything on this side. So I look at the column heading here. Okay, and I got 0 .001. So is my tail area going to be more than 0 .001 or less than 0 .001? Less, right? Because if we look at the other column headings, they start off big over here, and as we go to the right, they get smaller. So if I'm even more to the right, my tail area is less than 0 0.001. Is that okay? All right. L let's look at my alternative hypothesis. I've got a not equal sign. So what does that mean? My, it's two-sided, so I have to double my tail area for my p-value. So p-value is equal to is uh, two times the tail area because you know alternative has a not equal sign. Okay. So what does this mean? My p-value is then what? My corresponding p-value. Whatever it is, I don't have an exact value, but I do know that my p-value is less than 0 0.002, 0 0.001 times 2. So I know my p-value is less than 0 0.002. Whoa. Is that the, uh, the tail area being less than 0 0.001? Yes. How did you get that again? How did I get that? Okay, so, so let's look at our column headings, okay? So you're okay with the 5.4 being here and that it's going to be something in relation to 0 0.001, right? Okay, so if we look at our column headings here, it starts off at 0 0.10, then it goes down to 0 0.05, 0 0.025. So what we see is that they start off large over here and they get small over here. Okay, so as we go to the right, they get smaller and smaller. 5.4 is to the right of 4.144, so the corresponding tail area is going to be smaller than 0 0.001. Is that okay? Everyone's good with this? All right, and so, um, so what we have here is that my corresponding p-value, I double this number and I say my p-value is less than 0 0.002. Got it? Okay, so do we feel comfortable with this? Right. Yeah? Okay, we'll, uh, okay, so I'm gonna do, um, we'll do a, an example here. All right, so we wanna say, um, <coughs> we'll go back to my silly example. Um, is the, Average weight of a tomato. <laughs> Average weight of a. Now, I really want to know now. I'm going to go on. Well, no, we already tried this and we couldn't get our answer, didn't right? Ask Lady Google. I didn't ask Lady Google, right? Okay. Average weight of a beef steak tomato. We will say um, uh, different. from 250 grams. That's what we want to know. So is the average weight of a beefsteak tomato different from 250 grams, okay? So we, um, we collect data. So let me actually just uh, flip back a few slides and just look at the data we had earlier. 240, 28, and 20. Okay, so we um, we collect data. Okay, so we uh, look at a random sample. Uh, Twenty tomatoes. The average weight of these twenty tomatoes. 
is um, I'm going to say 244 grams. The standard deviation is 27 grams. Okay, so we'll say um, perform a hypothesis test to see if we have evidence that the average weight of beefsteak tomatoes is different from 250 grams. Oh, let's do our attendance thing. So does somebody does somebody have a piece of paper that they don't mind? Uh... All right. Oh, okay. Well, I got one. Okay. I'll do this. I can take attendance for two weeks now. All right. Um, okay. So please um, number this and uh, and print your name. Uh, and today's attendance sheet. For November 17th, 2015. Okay, yeah, I, d I don't need uh, I don't need your signature. Just so just print your name nice and clear. Just sign yourself in. Don't sign in your friends. I'll you know, just tell them. So, um, so I should have the number of names on this paper. Oh yeah, yeah. and there's one student here. Okay, number of names should match the. Uh... Okay, that's. I will keep that in mind here. Okay, so um, perform a hypothesis test to see if we have evidence that the average weight of beefsteak tomatoes is different from 250 grams. Okay, are we ready to do this? We all all got this written down. All right, so we start off by writing our hypotheses, right? So what are the hypotheses we would use here? The null is, what are, what are we testing against? That the mean is equal to, do I put in 244, or do I put in 250, or do I put in some other number? So the, the question says, perform a hypothesis test to see if we have evidence that the average weight of beefsteak tomatoes is different from 250 grams. So our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean is equal to 250. And then the alternative is going to be what? Not equal. Not equal. Different from 250. So what, what kind of test do we have, one-sided or two-sided? Two-sided two test. Okay, great. So number two, let's gather our data. Okay, so we need x bar, we need s, and we need n. What is my x bar? 244. 244. This is our sample mean. This is what we observed. What is the s that I have? 27 grams, right? The standard deviation is 27 grams. And n? 20. That's how many tomatoes I have in my sample. Okay, so now we're going to get our test statistic t. So t is equal to x bar minus mu divided by our standard error. And our standard error is equal to s over the square root of n. Okay, So let's plug in our standard error. Our standard error is going to be s27 divided by the square root of 20, and so my standard error is going to be 27 divided by, let me move this over here, 
the square root of 20, I get 6.037. Yeah? Okay. And then so my t is going to be 244x bar minus, what is my mu? 250, and I divide by the standard error, 6.037. So here I have 244 minus 250, I get a negative 6 over 6.037, okay? So what I'm going to do here is actually I can just do this 244 minus 250 in parentheses, divide by, I'm going to hit the answer key because I already have the standard error plugged in here for the answer. So I hit equals and I get negative 0 0.9938. So this is my t. So far so good? Okay. All right, what do I do now? I'm going to take my t and go where? Yeah, so the next step is we look up, we're going to look this up in the t table. How many degrees of freedom do I have? Degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. So how many degrees of freedom do I have? 19 degrees of freedom. Is every, everything OK with everybody? So we're going to look for where 0, 0 0.9938 fits in in our t table. So notice we have a negative sign, OK? The t table is only gives us positive values, and that's okay because it's symmetric. Okay, so even though we have a negative sign, we're going to ignore the negative sign. Okay, so um, we just ignore the negative sign here, and that's okay. And we just we're going to look for positive 0 0.9938 in our t table. So we go to 19 degrees of freedom. All right. So looking at 19 degrees of freedom, I'm looking for where 0 0.9938 fits in. And where does it go? It goes over here, right? 0 0.9938 fits right here. So what does that tell me about my corresponding tail area? So my tail area is what? Greater than 0 0.100, right? So what we get is that our tail area is greater than 0 0.100. Is that OK? I just want to kind of pause here for a moment and make sure that we can that we're okay with all of the steps we've done so far. Um, I hear no res yeah. Show again, yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. How it's greater than. Okay, so, so we're okay with getting this uh, negative 0.9938, right? And then I'm saying, we're going to ignore the negative, and we're going to look for just positive 0.9938. Okay? So I have 19 degrees of freedom, and I see, well, if I had to fit 0 0.9938, 0 0.9938 would fit in over here, meaning it's uh, on this side of 1.328. It's less than 1.328. That, that part's OK so far, right? Yeah, that part is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so so then I go to the corresponding column heading, and so our tail area is either going to be more than this or less than this, okay? And what we see is that over here we start large and we get small over here. So, you know, if I'm to the left of some column, I'm bigger than this but smaller than this one. So what I'm, and I'm to the left of, oh, sorry, I'm to the left of this column, 
And so that means our tail area is larger than 0.100. Okay, because. Wait, but what's to the left? Uh, 0.9938 is to the left of 1.328. So that column is the tail area? Uh, so this, so where this goes, I go to the top and in relation to this. So this, this tells me that my test statistic is small, you know, in relation to 1.328 is to the left of 1.328. So our corresponding tail area is in relation to 0 0.10 is, is to the left of that, which in our case means it's larger. Yeah? The only thing I'm just confused about is if you're saying to the right over there is smaller, then why would it be larger? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, the way the way the t table works is as your test statistics get bigger, the corresponding tail area gets smaller. Okay. So that that's just. I don't know, sorry about this. Uh, I don't know. There's like auto gain. Okay. So as as we go further to the right, the amount left in the tail gets less and less and less. Okay. So you can you can kind of think of it as you've got a tank. And as the level in the tank gets higher, how much do we have left? How much is in kind of the area that's left? That gets smaller and smaller. That's what we, we're basically doing. So as we go further to the right, the amount that's left in the tail is, gets smaller and smaller. So over here, 0 0.9938 is less than 1.328. So our corresponding tail is larger than 0 0.10. Oh, is that OK? I think as you do your homework, you're gonna you're gonna kind of get get the hang of this. Okay, so is this my p value? No. Now what do I have to do? I multiply it by two, right? Because I have a two-sided test. So my p value is going to be greater than what? 0 0.100 times two, which means my p value is greater than 0 0.200. And is that OK? OK. And so uh, may I flip to the next slide now? OK. So if, if I'm using alpha equal to 5%, so I got my p-value, whatever it is, I don't have an exact value, but I do know it's more than 0.200. And if I'm using alpha equal to 0 0.05, what is the conclusion I make? The conclusion, do I not reject? Do I reject? We do not reject the null hypothesis. OK. And so what, what does this conclusion mean in the context of our problem? We would say we do not have evidence that what? Against the null, but what does the null what does the null hypothesis stay say? We do not have evidence that the um, or I'm sorry, we do not have evidence yeah that the average weight of beefsteak tomatoes is not 250 grams, OK? Or we can say, um, so I, I know some people don't like this because of the double negative. We can also write the same thing, which basically says, we do not have evidence against the claim that the average weight is 250 grams. Is that OK? All right, one last topic. Seriously, yeah. But it's, it's, it's all the same. It's all the same, OK? If you can do this, you can do the other thing. The only thing that's changed is just we've got a few more letters involved, OK? But the concepts, like conceptually, this is exactly the same as last week, right? As far as hypothesis testing goes with proportions, conceptually, it's still the same. 
It's just the, the letters that we're using have changed. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to the next slide. All right, and so the last thing, hypothesis tests for um, for means with two samples. Okay, so one nice thing about this, the null hypothesis is always going to be mu one is equal to mu two or the equivalent version of writing it, that mu1 minus mu2 equals 0. Okay, And this should almost feel like deja vu, except instead of the p hat, p's, we're using mu's. Right? This is exactly what we did last week. And the, the alternative, mu1 not equal to mu2, or mu1 greater than mu2, or mu1 less than mu2. Okay. All right. So that's uh, step one. Step two is uh, gather and label the data. So you're going to have sample one. So sample one has uh, x bar one, s one, n one, and sample two has x bar two, s two, and n two. Test statistic t. And uh, look up the p value, right? Is part three. So your t, so this is the only part that kind of changes x bar one minus x bar two divided by the standard error. Standard error is equal to the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. And then you look this up. And then uh, look t up in the t table. Okay, Degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. But we have two n's. So use the smaller of n1 and n2. And then at the end of this, the conclusions are exactly as they were before, right? I, do I, I don't have to rewrite that entire slide, OK? So then you know, step four would be make, make your conclusion you know, as same as before, compared to the alpha and whatnot. Oh, one, I guess just one, one thing, OK? Um, and not all the textbooks are in agreement over this, but um, but we're gonna we're gonna do this. If you can't find your exact degrees of freedom in the table, so so once you get past thirty, it's like eh, I'm not gonna list off all of these things, right? So you might have a situation where you have forty-eight degrees of freedom, 
or something like that. And you go here and you're like, oh, I got 40 and I got 50. What do I do? If you can't find your exact degrees of freedom, um, the safe thing is to always round down, okay? So even though 48 is closer to 50, always round down. So it's, it's like, you know, maybe you can only buy 48 uh, paper plates or whatever. How many, at most, how many people should you invite? If you can invite between, you know, invitations come in 40 or 50, get, get the 40, right? So I don't, I don't know what's going on with the microphone today, but, um, but that's that, okay? So if you can't find, I'll, I'll write this down. If you can't find your exact degrees of freedom, and the table always rounds down. Down to the nearest DF, but rounds down. Okay, and, uh, and that's hypothesis testing for means with two samples. Um, okay, okay, great. Um, oh, all right. Um, well, now I feel like I have to count all these people. So, for example, if it's 45 or something. Yeah, if it's 45 degrees of freedom, always always round down. So, I just hang out there. Are, are there any questions on anything? We're all okay? Huh? What's that? No example for this one? I, I, I feel like we've done enough examples and it's just a matter of more letters, identifying them, plugging them in. Question? Yes, flashcard on the quiz next week. That'll be good. Okay. All right. Uh, see you guys next week.